Okay, well we'll go ahead and get started. We are a little bit behind, but I think we're making it up. And it's okay if we're just a little bit, right? It's all right. All right, well we are so um, excited and blessed to have Rochelle Chase um, to kick off our breakouts today. Her address is called Be You to Full. Finding Increased Joy Through Self-Love. And so I'm just going to introduce Rochelle a little bit. Um, as, you can, as you can see in her bio, um, she regularly addresses and speaks motivationally. Um, she's a teacher, an author, and a life coach. And she just really values and, and her passion is to share um, the truths that she's learned herself and be able to connect and relate those truths to others. Um, we, we have some fun connections. Um, she and the Connect, Peter, go way back to, so that, was, that was an, wasn't the initial connection, but we found that one out as well. Um, Dave stayed here. Oh, they're right there. Dave and Rochelle have been called to the Illinois Chicago mission, and they'll be leaving in July. Is that right? So exciting. So we're... As, that's right, as um, the leadership in that mission. So um, we were so grateful that they were able to still fit this in their schedule and, and are excited for them. So without further ado, um, let's welcome Rochelle Chase. children here, but we love competing. We have, <laughs> we have children at Carl G. Mazur Preparatory Academy, and so we have been friendly rivals. But, but we love American heritage and so many good things coming from this institution. Well, I am so grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today on a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and the emotions are already rolling, that of self-love and self-care in the Lord's way. Satan is raging in the hearts and minds of many, leading them into self-hatred, self-neglect, and self-harm. I am passionate about speaking up and speaking out for the Lord's way of counteracting Satan's influence through appropriately and needfully loving and caring for the divine creation of self. I absolutely love the quote by President Nelson that is the theme of this retreat. The joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives, and everything to do with the focus of our lives. And I want to discuss this quote in a way that may not be an obvious connection. So I begin with a scripture that we all know well. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love thy, the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The as thyself in these great commandments seems to get dropped off often and not acknowledged or talked about, but I believe it wouldn't be there if it wasn't an important and even crucial piece of our joy, peace, and eternal salvation. Elder S. Gifford Nielsen stated, I don't know about you, but when I read these two great commandments, I detect a third implied commandment, to love thyself. Have you ever thought of loving yourself as a commandment? Can we truly love God and love his children if we don't love ourselves? Our Heavenly Father <coughs> wants us to love ourselves, not to become prideful or self-centered, but to see ourselves as he sees us. We are his cherished children. When this truth sinks deep into our hearts, our love for God grows. When we view ourselves with sincere respect, our hearts are open to treat others that way too. The more we recognize our divine worth, the better we understand this divine truth that God has sent us right here, right now, at this momentous time in history, so that we can do the greatest possible good with the talents and gifts we have. This is our time. Elder Rasband also made mention of this critical truth. As he shared the things of his soul, his third point was this. Third, love yourself. This is where many struggle. Isn't it curious that loving ourselves seems to come less easily than loving others? Yet the Lord has said, love thy neighbor as thyself. 
He values the divinity within us, and so must we. These statements resonate with me. I feel to love our neighbor as ourselves is not only a command, but a principle of truth that when honored brings increased joy and peace into our lives. Elder Holland has stated, for the truly difficult problems, we need what the scriptures call the powers of heaven. And to access these powers, we must live by what these same scriptures call principles of righteousness. Now, understanding that connection be between principle and power is the one lesson the human family never seems able to learn. So says the God of heaven and earth. Obviously, we've got some work for you, right? <laughs> we are being told that the powers of heaven are available to us in greater abundance. But we have to do our part to receive them. We need to live by principles of righteousness in order to access the power or to experience the powers of heaven in the form of joy, peace, freedom, and love. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. The word might in this scripture is very instructive, and I believe it points to our agency. There are choices we need to make and principles of truth we need to follow if we want to feel of that great joy that we were created to experience. We read in the scriptures that charity is the pure love of Christ. I have pondered what pure love really means, and I've come to believe that pure love begins with the love of God. God is love, so we need to be connected in him in order to have pure love within us. That's why that command comes first. Elder Holland stated, this love of God is the first great commandment in the universe. But the first great truth in the universe is that God loves us exactly that way, wholeheartedly, without reservation or compromise, with all of his heart, might, mind, and strength. And when those majestic forces from his heart and ours meet without restraint, remember that phrase, without restraint, there is a veritable explosion of spiritual moral power. It is then and really only then that we can effectively keep the second great commandment in ways that are not superficial or trivial. If we love God enough to try to be fully faithful to him, he will give us the ability, the capacity, the will, and the way to love our neighbor and ourselves. Perhaps then we will be able to say once again, there cannot be a happier people among all the people who have been created by the kingdom. That is the goal. That is the ideal. That is perfect love, joy, and peace. Now, both self and others are mentioned in the second great commandment, which says to me that not only are they both important and needful, but that they are also interrelated and connected. The as in that command seems to represent a reciprocal and even equal relationship between the love of others and the love of self. Why else would God link you and me together there? I believe that means pure love cannot exist without self-love or without loving others. We need both, even at the same time. The only way to hold balance and give space for these two entities is love for both, compassion for both. We are all equal in the sight of God, equally loved and treasured by him. God is no respecter of persons, and the worth of every soul is great in his eyes. If that's how he sees us, then that's how we need to see ourselves and others. Self and others don't have to be mutually exclusive as Satan wants us to believe. As soon as we put one above or below the other and disconnect them through shame or pride, we have entered Satan's realm of fear, of better than or less than, of good enough or not good enough, of I'm right and you're wrong, of comparison and enmity. This is not of God. This is equality unity is. Charity for all, including self is. But what does that look like? How can I possess that kind of love and thus the power of the first great commandments? I believe this is what it looks like. This is perfect love. Loving God, self, and others at the same time. When we choose to receive God's beautiful, pure, white light of love, we will be empowered to radiate and refract that same love outwards towards others in a beautiful array of colors that represent our unique God-given qualities, gifts, and talents. We were created to shine. Christ invites and instructs 
Therefore, hold up your light, that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light that ye shall hold up. The light and love of God is our light source. The truth is, once you receive his love, your greatest desire is to give it away. That's just how the love of God works. This is what I feel it means to be beautiful. beautiful. This is what I feel it looks like to honor the first great commandment, staying connected to all three entities at the same time. So what blocks this from happening? Why are we stunted in our ability at times to receive and then radiate Christ's pure love? It's fear. Fear of men, the fear of pain, the fear of not belonging and not being good enough. The list of different fears could go on and on. Fear is the block. In DNC 67, 1 through 3, it states this. Behold and hearken, O ye elders of my church who have assembled yourselves together. That's all of us. Whose prayers I have heard and whose hearts I know and whose desires have come up before me. Behold and lo, mine eyes are upon me and the heavens and the earth are in mine hands and the riches of eternity are mine to give. Do you hear God's love for us there? God wants to pour down his bounteous riches upon us. He sees us. He hears our prayers. He knows our hearts and our desires. He wants to give us all he has. Then listen to what he says next. Ye endeavor to believe that ye should receive the blessing which was offered unto you. But behold, verily I say unto you, there were fears in your hearts. And verily this is the reason that ye did not receive it. Fears in our hearts. We can block ourselves from receiving God's blessings through fearful beliefs. Thus, choosing to receive is the key. And that work is not easy. That means banishing fear. We are taught that perfect, pure love, loving does not exemplify this in his life. If the atonement was the greatest act of pure love ever to be performed, then Christ had to be in a space of perfect, pure love, loving God. Christ's first purpose and above all else wanted to do his will. Thus, he was willing to atone for us, even though he didn't want to feel all that pain and ask for that cup to be removed. He first chose to honor the first great commandment. Secondly, he perfectly loved himself and all of us at the same time, honoring the second great commandment. I think the only way he was able to perform the atonement was that he stayed perfectly connected to those three entities while he suffered. If he had forgotten himself, disconnected from who he was and his purpose on this earth, then he wouldn't have been able to feel all our pain, all our sorrow, all our sin. He could not distract or deny or escape as we often do when we feel pain. No, Christ had to feel it all intimately in order to become our personal savior and redeemer. Our pain had to become that is the only way he now has the power to suffer us, comfort us, and save us. Our Savior did not forget himself in order to atone for us. He perfectly remembered who he was so that he could become our Savior. This is pure love, staying connected to love of God, self, and others at the same time, even if it's painful. And that is what we have been commanded to strive for and choose for ourselves this is the appropriate motive for self-love and self-care in the Lord's way. This is why we love ourselves, because he first loved us. As we love ourselves, as God loves us, as we see ourselves, as God sees us, we will quite naturally love others in that same pure way. My life journey is a witness to the truth that loving myself in the Lord's way is not only a command, but a divine principle of truth, power, peace, and joy. I grew up with very poor self-worth and self-value. Quite frankly, I hated myself. I remember often thinking that I wish I could escape my own skin. I felt I was in a constant battle between my body, mind, and spirit. I expected perfection of myself in all that I did, in all that I said, in how I looked, never fully grasping the truth that perfection by my own effort was impossible. 
I believed that being perfect would mean that I was lovable, acceptable enough, and worthy of belonging. So I would beat myself up mentally and emotionally when I didn't achieve that standard. Due to the external pressures I felt were coming toward me, the pressure I put on myself to be perfect, and the lack of that desired outcome, at the age of 15, I developed an eating disorder. Now, I was beating myself up physically. I was miserable, anxious, depressed, and hated myself all the more because of it. And yet, I also had a desire to heal. I spent night after night pouring out my heart to Heavenly Father, pleading for relief and deliverance, asking Him through anguished tears to help me learn whatever I needed to learn to feel the peace, joy, love, and acceptance I yearn for. I know God sent His grace, as it states in Mosiah 24, he gave me strength day to day to endure the bondage I was in, but he did not deliver me until much later. I spent 22 years trying to heal my body, heart, and mind of my distorted thoughts and beliefs and the damaging behaviors that I engaged in. I tried diet programs, exercise programs, mental and emotional healing programs and groups, therapy, antidepressants, and alternative methods of emotional healing. None of those brought the permanent relief I was seeking. It wasn't until age 37 that I found lasting healing through newly discovered truths. John 8, 32 states, "Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that is exactly what happened to me. I had always known that I was a daughter of God. I grew up seeing that beloved children's hymn, I am a child of God. But what I came to realize is that I didn't believe it. I didn't believe in my heart what that meant about me, that I was worthy and lovable and enough simply because I was a daughter of God, that that was an unchanging and eternal truth of my divine identity, and that it was that condition alone that qualified me for Christ's love and acceptance. His love for me was unconditional, but I could not see that or believe that because of my intense fear of what others thought of me. My fear blocked not only that understanding, but also my ability to receive and accept of my Heavenly Father's and my Savior's pure love for me. I'd like to share with you some tools that in my experience not only help me overcome an eating disorder, but help me learn to love and care for myself in the Lord's way, and thus find the peace, freedom, love, and joy in my life that I was searching for. My first two tools are becoming aware of your thoughts and beliefs and using your God-given power of agency to choose truthful thoughts and beliefs. Ten years ago, my mentor helped me see where my problem was, and it wasn't in my worth and value or my willpower or capability. It was in the negative, distorted thoughts and beliefs I chose to embrace about myself. I knew I talked and felt awful about myself, but I had not been taught that was the problem. How can we fix a problem if we're not aware it's a problem? I had to slow down and gain awareness because awareness is the entry point of change. The truth is, we are not our thoughts. Thoughts do not define us. One of my favorite quotes is this. People are not their thoughts. They think they are and it brings them all kinds of sadness. The mind is just a reflex organ, reacts to everything, fills your head with millions of random thoughts a day. None of those thoughts reveal any more about you than a freckle does at the end of your nose. I love it. Thoughts come from everywhere. Media, friends, family, the world, God, and Satan. Just because we think something doesn't make it true about us. We are the observer of thoughts, not the thoughts themselves. So how do we reconcile that truth with this scripture? As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. I believe this actually proves the truth that we are not our thoughts. It's not as he thinketh in his mind, so is he. Hi, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> it's about our hearts. It's the thoughts we choose to accept and believe in our heart as truth that become us. It's our choice. We are agents unto ourselves. We have the power to act, to choose, and not passively be acted upon by whatever thoughts come into our minds. What a gift, what a power. In scripture, we are also warned to think about what we are thinking about and told about the dangers of not. But this much I can tell you, 
that if you do not watch yourselves and your thoughts and your words and your deeds and observe the commandments of God and continue in the faith of what you have heard concerning the coming of our Lord, even unto the end of your lives, ye must perish. And now, O oh man, remember and perish not. Thoughts are the first thing mentioned here of what we need to watch in ourselves. Because thoughts come first, then word and deed follow. This is where letting God prevail begins, in our thoughts. If we are not remembering to watch our thoughts and choose truth, we will perish. And that doesn't just mean eventual death way down the road. We need to think of it as pertaining to our health in body, mind, and spirit in this very moment, in the present. The practices of metacognition and mindfulness are prominent today because they are life skills that lead to greater health and wellness, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and socially as well. And I believe this diagram shows why. This is what I call the thought cycle. Thousands of times a day we have an experience. Thousands of times a day we are interpreting what that experience means. And as mentioned before, thoughts can come from a myriad of external sources, but they also come from our internal core beliefs, those thoughts that we have chosen again and again to believe are true about us. So this whole cycle begins with thoughts that are either in truth or distortion, which is another word I like to use for Satan's lies. And as you can see, this is how it plays out. That thought leads to a feeling or feelings, which leads to a behavior, which leads to an outcome, which leads to another thought, and we start the cycle all over again. So you can see why the thoughts we choose to believe become us. In the end, the cycle looks like this. My negative thoughts and beliefs will yield a downwards negative spiral. Positive thoughts and beliefs and upwards positive spiral. So what is the key to shifting from a negative spiral to a positive, our agency. We have choice, we can change, we can shift. The key is awareness and then choice. We do it by going backwards through the thought cycle. It requires us to take time to become curious, self-introspective, and self-investigative. What was the outcome? What did I do? Why did I do that? What was I feeling and thinking? What are the core beliefs that got triggered in that experience? We need awareness. We can't change something if we don't know it, it exists. We may also need help to do this, to even see the problem and how the thought cycle is playing out in us. I needed that. It's okay to ask for help from God or a trusted family member, friend, therapist, or life coach, or church leader. This is not a question of worth and value, willpower, or capability. It's not about blame or fault. Rather, it's more like a computer. If a computer gets a virus, then it needs to be wiped clean and reprogrammed. Our faulty programming needs to be rebooted with truthful and accurate processing information. Through awareness, acknowledgement, and using our agency to choose a different thought or seeking help and support when we need it, we can change, we can heal. We can learn to function from healthy and truthful programming. Then, by believing and acting on principles of truth, we can be empowered to access the power of joy, peace, faith, and love. I love the question God asked Adam in the Garden of Eden after Adam confesses to God that he was afraid and hid himself because he was naked. God asked, who told thee that thou was naked? Do you hear the tool that God is giving Adam in this question? I invite you, as God invited Adam, to slow down and get curious about your thoughts. Pay attention. Think about what you are thinking about. Ask yourself, who told me that? Is it God or Satan? How does that thought make me feel? Is it truth or lies about my divine identity, worth, and value? If it's lies you hear, I plead with you, don't believe them, because they are not you many years believing those lies, and it just led to misery and despair. I love this quote because it shows our power 
If Satan could but capture our minds, he would have won the battle and the war. He can only do this if we let him. You will always be stronger than he is. He is just a thought. You are so much more. The truth is, you are human and a child of God, period. That is your identity. Nothing else defines who you are. Not what you look like, not what you believe, not what you have, not what you do, not what you achieve, not where you were born or where you live. You are divine, beautiful, enough, capable, and worthy of love because you exist. <coughs> the next tool is conquering fear through, our strength, through the strength and power of God. As we learned earlier, God wants to pour out his blessings upon us, but he is blocked when we are blocked by fear. Fear is our enemy. Thus, Satan is our enemy because he is the author of fear. He is miserable and thus wants to deceive us so that he can drag us down to that gulf of misery and endless woe with him. Misery loves company. He manipulates us to point our finger of blame and anger at God, others, and ourselves in order to distract, distract us from seeing him as the enemy. Satan gets us to feel fear by placing thoughts of shame or pride in our minds, and he succeeds when we believe him. In fact, not only does he succeed, but we inadvertently protect him when we believe him. Again, gaining awareness of our thoughts can help us identify Satan's voice and how he speaks to us. Only when we see him can we cast him out. I think the story of Moses coming face to face with Satan gives us a powerful tool we can use to conquer fear. Moses tried casting out Satan twice with the knowledge of who God was and who he was as God's son. But Satan didn't leave. <coughs> Satan tempted Moses again and fear started to overtake him. It says he began to fear exceedingly and as he began to fear, he saw the bitterness of hell. Nevertheless, Calling upon God, you receive strength. Fear is the bitterness of hell. As Moses coupled who he was as a son of God with the power and strength of God, Satan <coughs> departed weeping, wailing, and gnashing his teeth. We need our Savior. We are human and limited in our power. This is not about our worth or value, though Satan tries to convince us it is. This is about our natural man human weakness that we need Christ's power and grace to overcome. This is why the natural man is an enemy to God. This is what Moses meant when he said, I know that man is nothing, which thing I never have supposed. We are nothing? This can seem confusing because Moses had just learned from God himself that he was a son of God and that God had a work for him to do. However, it is understandable because of the fact that we are completely dependent on God for our very breath and life. He is our creator. Elder Uchtdorf called this the paradox of man. We are nothing without God, but we are everything to God. We are both. Our nothingness and everythingness coexist. Satan tries to deceive us to believe they are mutually exclusive, just as, he do, does, just as he does with the love of self and others. In fact, he's doing this today with many of the truths and polarities of God, isolating them and creating extremism in them, that we can only be one or the other or have one or the other, justice and mercy, law and love, mind and heart. This is referred to as black and white, either or, all or nothing thinking. We need both. And I believe this paradox looks like this. We are like this pen. When we believe we are nothing, we're holding on to one end of the pen. We feel shame, less than, not enoughness, worthless, and so on. We fall. This belief system will fail because it's not based in truth. It is bondage to Satan and his lies. When we isolate everything, we're just holding on to the other end of the pen. We feel pride, better than, superiority, superiority, and worth more. We fall. This belief system too will fail because it's not based in truth. It's bondage. Both sides fall, both sides fail. Do you hear the comparison and self-focus in both of these extremes? Satan loves it. 
when we get into either of these belief systems about ourselves because they both disconnect us from the truth of who we are as God's children and what that means about us and for us. The only way for peace and joy is balance. In the truth that we are nothing and everything at the same time, human and divine, that we are loved and everyone else is too. When we are connected to that reality, that is where humility, equality, and unity is, where we can feel confident in Christ, and where pure love, peace, joy, and power abounds. It's about the balance. We seem to understand pride more than we understand shame. So I'd like to expound on what I have learned about shame. Shame is not of God and is extremely detrimental and destructive if we choose to believe it. Shame often gets confused with guilt, but guilt and shame are not the same thing. Guilt is of God and is healthy in motivating us to repent of wrongdoing and sin. It helps us turn back to God and the peace, joy, freedom, and love that can only be found on the covenant path. But guilt can quickly, quickly morph into shame. Shame is of Satan. It is his voice in our hearts and minds. Satan's shame equates behavior with being. If I did something bad, I am bad. Whereas guilt in God would say, I made a mistake, and I am a child of God who is loved and accepted, and I can repent and be cleansed of that mistake or sin through the gift of Jesus Christ's atonement. When we hear we are not enough, incapable, unacceptable, and unworthy of love and belonging, that is shame and that is Satan, not you. It only becomes you when you choose to believe it. Satan desires us to believe that what we do and say, what we look like, what we have, what we achieve, where we were born, what others do to us, or what they think or say about us equals who we are. In each of those things, we are seeing ourselves through a horizontal lens instead of a vertical lens. Horizontal means I'm looking at the world to define my worth, value, and identity. Vertical means I'm looking at God for that information. Satan, of course, wants us to stay focused horizontally because it leads to fear, and fear disconnects us from God and his blessings. The story of Peter walking on the water to Christ illustrates this horizontal and vertical vision. Peter, after knowing it was Christ walking on the stormy sea, bid that he could come out to Christ on the water. Christ invited him, and Peter crawled over the side of the boat, and he did it. He was walking on water. What faith that would have taken to choose to crawl over the side of the boat into the rocky waves and trust Christ that he would be okay. And then Peter looked horizontal. He felt the wind and saw the waves boisterous and began to fear. That's when he started to sink. This is such an important part of the story that I feel we need to apply to our lives. Are we not all human? Do we not have great intentions of faith at times only to be sideswiped by the storms and boisterous waves of life beating against us, by danger coming towards us and feeling unsafe? Do we not at times take our vertical focus off of the Savior and turn it horizontal towards the world in fear? This is human. We will look horizontal from time to time because it's very easy in this mortal, fallen world to get distracted by the visual and physical plane of our existence and to feel fear over what we see. While it's understandable and not something to be ashamed of, it is a manifestation of lack of faith. Faith in our true source of safety, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why I love Peter so much for what he taught us to do in those moments when we get distracted and caught up in looking horizontal for our identity, worth, value, and safety. What did he do? He looked vertical. He refocused his eyes back on the Savior and reconnected to his faith and the true source of his safety by saying, Lord, save me. And it says immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Brothers and sisters, immediately Christ offers his hand when we ask him for help. Immediately he will give us the strength and power we need to walk on the boisterous waters of our lives. All we need to do is in faith look vertical and ask. We learn this principle from Moses and Peter and so many other examples in the scriptures. God may not fully deliver us in that moment. He didn't for me. 
but he will immediately be there to strengthen us and help us rise above the storms of life. The reality and the truth is that we are imperfect, fallible, vulnerable human beings. That's just what we are. But because we are also divine, we have access to the one who has all power and can offer us his strength to help us conquer the adversary. We are human and divine, nothing and everything. I invite you to ask yourself some other questions as you experience the storms of life. Am I feeling this way because I am looking horizontal? Am I focused on my fear of man and the world? Do I need to get vertical by focusing my eyes on the Lord and humbly seek his strength and power? Again, it's about our focus. President Nelson has stated, my brothers and sisters, I plead with you to make time for the Lord. Make your own spiritual foundation firm and able to stand the test of time by doing those things that allow the Holy Ghost to be with you always. Nothing invites the spirit more than fixing your focus on Jesus Christ. We cannot, as limited mortal human beings, fully conquer Satan, his fiery darts and storms of fear, without the enabling power of Jesus Christ. We need him and his strength to crush Satan. Even just speaking the name of Jesus Christ brings power. Without the Lord, we are left to ourselves to kick against the pricks in trying to find peace, joy, freedom, and love in this life. The truth is, we have the opportunity to be more than conquerors through him that loved us. My last tool is appropriate and needful self-care. We learn a great <coughs> truth about self-care in this scripture. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I hear in that scripture a command to take care of ourselves because our creation, our body, mind, and spirit is God's. And by taking care of our creation in the Lord's way, we glorify God. I feel when we purely love and take care of ourselves, we are saying to God, thank you, God, for my creation. Thank you for spending your precious time creating me in the entirety of who I am. I love you, and I will honor your love, time, and effort by taking care of my creation as I would a garden, a temple, or a child. I know my creation is my stewardship that you have given me, and I alone am responsible for the care and well-being of it. Self-care breeds more self-love, and self-love breeds more self-care. I feel this is part of what President Nelson means by spiritual momentum. We need to take care of our needs in order to not only be our best selves, but to do the most good with the gifts and talents God has given us, and to become what we were created to become. Self-care is another principle of truth with a promise of power, which means using our agency to love and take care of ourselves in the Lord's way is a huge part of receiving the blessings of God. It's also how we teach ourselves that we matter. It's the way we create safety and trust within ourselves. Do you trust yourself? If not, the follow-up question is, are you taking care of yourself? Are you showing up for yourself in ways that tell your body, mind, and spirit, I hear you, I see you, I've got you, you can count on me. In other words, are you being your own best friend? If not, the beautiful thing is that there is hope. We can improve and change because, because of agency and the enabling power of Jesus Christ. The fact of the matter is that when we have unmet needs, we will feel overwhelmed, anxious, stressed, disconnected, and thus choose to behave or act out in a myriad of harmful ways towards ourselves and others. One way we can act out is by pointing our finger at others, or in other words, using and manipulating others to get what we need. When we don't take care of our own needs, it is easy to displace our personal responsibility for that onto other people. Often we are not aware this is why we are doing what we are doing. That's why self-awareness is so critical. And although we cannot control how others perceive or receive our words, we can be aware of our own fear and control and be more compassionate and curious as we engage with others. A common principle in business 
is it's not the person that's the problem, it's the process. It's the programming, not the person. Blame will never solve the problem. Pointing our finger at someone else will never satisfy our need. These are distractions from getting to the root of the problem and solving it. The solution is looking inward, not outward. What we say and do reveals more about ourselves than the other person. Once again, we can bring it back to focus. A great question to ask ourselves here is, does what I say and do reveal that I have a horizontal or a vertical focus? Another way we act out that I feel an urgent call to point out is in perfectionism. I believe perfectionism has reached an epidemic of ginormous and toxic proportions. I believe it's the source of much of the anxiety, depression, disconnect, addiction, and even suicide that is so many are experiencing. And it's got Satan's name written all over it. Perfectionism is an insidious lie. It is trying to control myself due to the fear that I will only be good enough and worthy of love, acceptance, and belonging when I am perfect. And I need to attain that perfection all by myself in order to prove I am perfect. Do you see the imperfection in that perfectionistic thinking? <laughs> totally imperfect. Perfectionism is a never-ending downward spiral into that pit of darkness and despair because it's humanly impossible. We can never ever attain perfection by our own mortal, fallible, imperfect effort. That's just a fact of our human existence. Do you hear my passion here? It's because I've lived it. When we believe the lie and then choose to engage in perfectionistic tendencies and behaviors, we are choosing to deny our need for and our dependence on our Savior's grace and mercy in order to one day, in the next life, be made perfect, or in other words, whole, complete, and fully developed. I've always loved the thought that all of us, whether old, young, or anywhere in between, are just a bunch of little kids walking around with backpacks on. I believe that's one of the reasons why Christ refers to us as little ones or little flock all throughout the scriptures. We have, this is, life is school. It's the school of becoming. We wouldn't be here if we were perfect. We have permission to be human, make mistakes and learn. That's all we can be with the potential to become perfect. Perfect now would mean we had learned all we needed to learn and become all that we were created to become. And that's not part of the program here in this part of our eternal progression but it will be in the next, if we choose to repent and follow Christ and do God's will. I love that Elder Holland has said that here on this earth, imperfect people are all God has to work with. Perfectionism stems from comparison, which is another fear tactic of Satan's and is the thief of joy. It says, I am perfect when I fit into the standards of the world on TV, billboards, and social media. I am perfect when I meet my parents, families, friends, coaches, teachers, and employers' expectations of what is lovable and acceptable. Should is a word that is common in a perfectionistic mindset. I should look like this. I should be like that. I should talk and act like them. Banish that word from your vocabulary. The idea of fitting in conflicts with the idea of belonging. They are not the same thing. And again, it comes back to focus. Perfectionism means I am looking horizontal instead of vertical for my worth and value. Being horizontally focused says I need to prove to the world <coughs> that I am perfect and worthy in order to fit in. Being vertically focused says I don't need to prove anything. I know I already belong because of who I am and whose I am. God created you just the way you are for a glorious purpose. Our purpose is his purpose to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of all men. We all are needed and have the opportunity to play a unique and vital role in his great work. We are here to fill the measure of our own personal and individual creation and have joy therein. Pure love of self and self-care are some of the greatest defenses and protections against perfectionism and all other forms of acting out, addiction, and self-harm. Another incorrect cultural belief about self-care is that it is selfish or prideful. We hear the phrase often that we need to be selfless and lose ourselves for others. 
I think many of us have misinterpreted and completely missed the mark on what those phrases mean. I feel it means losing our ego, our natural man, our fear and control, not our true selves, and or our responsibility to take care of our real needs. The truth is, we can't give that which we don't have. I can't give you money if I don't have money. I can't give you pure love if I don't have pure love. At the same time, we can't give that which we can only get for ourselves. Think of the 10 virgins. The five wise virgins could easily be seen as selfish because they didn't give up their oil to the other five. But that's not what this parable teaches us. It illustrates that there are things that only we can do and receive for ourselves. I love this quote by Elder Holland. He stated, in preventing illness whenever possible, watch for the stress indicators in yourself and in others you may be able to help. As with your automobile, be alert to rising temperatures, excessive speed, or a tank low on fuel. When you face, face depletion, depression, make the requisite adjustments. Fatigue is the common enemy of us all, so slow down. Rest up, replenish, and refill. Physicians promise us that if we do not take time to be well, we most assuredly will make time later on to be ill. We need to take time to be well through self-care. We see Christ during his time on earth removing himself to take care of his needs, going to a mountain to connect with God, telling his disciples to go on without him and that he would meet them later, taking time to eat, and even sleeping in the bottom of a boat amidst a storm. Christ self-cared. I cannot eat or drink for you. I cannot exercise or sleep for you. I cannot nourish you spiritually or open your heart to emotional healing. And I can't give you the blessings and positive outcomes that come from choosing to do those things. Only you and I can choose to do those things for ourselves. In the world today, self-care is most often spoken of in relation to our physical bodies. Working out, eating healthy, taking time to relax. Those are good things and needful, but they do not represent the entirety of what self-care means in the Lord's way. I feel self-care in the Lord's way includes every aspect of our human creation. I created a framework while working as a life coach, life coach with, with which to check ourselves on how we are doing taking care of ourselves. I call it knee reps. Just as one may do reps with weights to strengthen and maintain their muscles, we need self-care knee reps in order to strengthen and maintain strength in each area of our creation. Now, I don't have time to describe each of these areas in detail, so please refer to your handout to understand them more fully. Briefly, the me stands for mental self-care. The R for how I am taking care of my roles in life. The E for emotional, P for physical, S for social, and the last S for spiritual. Honoring these areas in a self-care routine addresses the whole of our creation and the multiple varied needs we inherently have as human beings. I invite you to use this to develop a self-care regimen and then consistently practice it. Consistency is the key to lasting results. As a result of implementing this strategy, I have seen great success in myself and in my clients in the form of increased joy and peace, freedom from addiction, perfectionism, and codependency, and more love and connection in relationships. Showing God we are willing to do the work of taking care of his creation and our stewardship of ourselves, we open ourselves to an increased downpour of his mercy, grace, power, and blessings. I bear my witness that Christ is the way. His gospel principles of righteousness are the only way to achieving peace, love, freedom, and the joy that we so desire in this life. I promise there is hope. There is always hope and healing because of him. Loving God, self, and others at the same time are not only commandments, but principles of truth and power that we need to choose to honor if we want his blessings. Choose to become aware of Satan and his attacking lies about your identity, worth, and value. Choose to use your powerful, God-given gift of agency to let God and his truth prevail. Cast Satan and his fear out, as Moses did. 
with the knowledge of who you really are as a son or daughter of God, coupled with the strength of your Savior. Be aware of your focus. Are you looking horizontal or vertical? If you are looking horizontal, do as Peter, and with whatever faith you can muster, fix your eyes vertically on the Savior and ask for the Lord's power to help you walk on your modern-day stormy waters. I plead with you to love and take care of your beautiful creation by honoring your needs in a self-care regimen. Seek help if you need it from trusted family, friends, church leaders, a therapist, or life coach. You weren't born on an island. You're not meant to do this life alone. Most importantly, if you don't love you, If you don't love you, pray to God for help to love yourself as he loves you, to see yourself as he sees you, and to take care of yourself in the Lord's way so that you may be empowered through his grace and mercy to purely love and see others in that same way. As you do these things, you will not only have the strength to do all that is required and needful for you to do, but you will also become all that God has created you to become. You will be beautiful as you honor your divine identity, worth, work, and potential. I pray this will be your focus and thus your joy. I know these principles can work for you or for those you love if you choose to work them. I know because I've done the work and will continue to because now I'm experiencing the peace, joy, freedom, and love that I so desperately yearn for. I'm so grateful to God for my life, most especially for those 22 years, because without them, I wouldn't know what I know today with the passion and conviction that I have. I testify these things are true. I love my Savior, and I know that he has saved me and redeemed me. I'm where I am because of him and will forever be in his debt of his immediate goodness, love, power.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started just so we can stay um, on our schedule here. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, uh, but we are so thrilled that um, we have Don again to be able to 
um, share her wealth of knowledge and experience and platform and, and help us be able to understand it on um, just a different level and some actionable ways we can apply things in our lives. Um, we have a handout we're passing out, so just raise your hand if you need one of those. And I will go ahead and turn the time over to Don. Thank you so much, Don. All right, let's keep talking about pornography. Yay. <laughs> um, all right, I thought that this could be more of a discussion guided by you. I have a lot of things prepared, so depending on what direction you'd like to go. Um, but we can start with just maybe any questions that kind of came from earlier thoughts. You said you don't let your kids even be on YouTube anymore unless you're right there. Is there a reason why? Because I use a lot of YouTube. I use YouTube a lot for homeschool too, a lot. But there's um, a lot of really <laughs> explicit material, a lot of like violence. Like you know, anybody can upload anything. And, um, and so often if you let a video play to the end, another video will just keep playing. And so often if, you'll, if you leave the room and videos just keep playing, the algorithms will change and bad stuff will soon come, even if it's like unrelated. And that's happened just so many times that I don't want to, them to just have YouTube playing with them. I was wondering. Yeah. But there's an incredible, um, it took us like lots of years to get Google to do this, but they have a safe search restricted mode is what it's called on YouTube that you can turn on. And it, it gets a lot of the stuff. And um, and so 100% turn on restricted mode on YouTube no matter what. Just make sure that's on. Yeah. But still, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm a little paranoid, right? I look at what I do every day. <laughs> it's called restricted mode. Then you go to the settings. And you just you toggle it on. And um, if you are using any other Google products, like Google Search, then it's called Safe Search. It's so annoying they should actually turn on both when it's Google products. But um, so there's there's a lot of built-in filters already in the devices and in the platforms that we use. They're not amazing, but they are really worth using and turning on. One of my close allies has a website called Protect Young Eyes. Catch young eyes, and he goes through in-depth tutorials with screenshots, like on, on every app, every platform, every social media, about the the, the built-in tools. So protect young eyes. Um, for Google, okay, she's asking, do you have to do it on each device, or do you do it just for the account? You can just do it for the account, and then it will be turned on, and you can lock it for the account. So, yes, and, and if you have young kids, I think under age 13, then Google has something called Family Link, and you can force it to be locked under age 13, um, and parents have control. Now, it's annoying to view, so it's not that easy. I, if you get an app, if I have Family Link turned on for our kids, and you get an, a notification if they ever want to go to another website, and if you're not like with them, if I'm at work in a meeting, they're just out of luck getting where they want to go, but because <laughs> I can't improve it right then. So, yeah, so family link. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about uh, teaching your kids how to have a healthy relationship with technology instead of flocking them all the way until they're 18 and then you stuff it all on at once. Can you like, give an, an example of what like, the progress would be like for a child if they go from step to step? I, don't, I, mean, I know everyone's yeah. different, but it's kind of a general idea. Yeah, so. Let's brainstorm this together. So ideas about how we can help our kids develop healthy relationships with technology and that kind of phased approach. But he, we were talking about a lot of things. What do you think? So my kids don't have phones until they're, well, I kind of wait until they don't want a phone anymore. That's the thing have a phone. It's usually about 14 or 15 when they decide they can't, they, they can get without it. And, um, and you start with, can everybody hear her? Not very well. How about if you're speaking? Stand up. We can see your beautiful face. Okay, so we started with just texting, right? Because texting is the first form of social media. I watch it. We give them that for a little bit. And then just sort of introducing a few key social media. 
like, and it just depends on your family or your your group, but we, we use uh, Marco Polo as a one-on-one, -on -one, right, that they can use, or WhatsApp is a good one um, that we use in our ward. And so, um, but they're still, they don't have Facebook accounts, they don't, and that, that didn't happen. Like my son went on a mission and he had to get a Facebook account. To me, like those kind of social medias where you just post and like the world can see is like the last, the last. And so just start with one thing at a time and don't be afraid to take your time and don't be afraid to let them complain about it because that's healthy too. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Like if, for a child, if it's gone too far, it was okay for one child, but it's gone too far for a different child. Yeah, so um, your, what you gave a ch child was okay for one, but maybe it's gone too far for another. So how do you pull back is the question. Yeah, well, I can just pull back. You say, we're not ready yet, and that's tough, and there's going to be arguments, and you're going to be pulling out your hair, and they're going to say they hate you, and we just, we're in it together. <laughs> there's this incredible Facebook group that's run by Bark. You heard me talk about Bark earlier. It's called Parenting in a Tech World. The closed Facebook group. It's so, it's my, like, I would just go on Facebook for that, <laughs> for that group because I find so much camaraderie. And it's just parents who are trying to make it in the world and figure out the best solution. And then they, so I, I encourage you to join that group, Parenting in a Tech World. And um, I, I would say faith approaches. I, I do think that, um, like, my, my kids are young, they're under eight. And we just have Facebook Messenger for kids so that we can talk with cousins and grandparents. And it's super lost. They can't talk to anybody else. A few people from the ward and neighbors. Um, so like really know the platforms and what you're comfortable with. And it really depends on your child and what their interests are. Um, I will say a lot of people think like Pinterest is safe for kids because us moms are like on it all the time and we don't see anything bad. But the, oh, this is the problem. The algorithms on these platforms are very different for our kids and for us. So while we might see like Instagram and exercise and fashion tips on Instagram, um, that's not what our kids are seeing. Um, I'll just talk for a minute. I was meeting with Senator Lee two days ago, and we've been begging him to set up a fake account, and he finally did it. And he was telling us what happened. So he pretended he was a 13-year-old girl. And all he did was set this up on Instagram, and immediately he was um, he was getting like explicit sexualized content, not like pornography yet, but really hypersexualized. And then they suggested that he like Kylie Jenner, so he liked Kylie Jenner. That's what Instagram suggests. And as soon as he liked her, his account, his 13-year-old girl self, was just fed like diet, extreme exercise, like body image, crazy stuff. Coming. And then it, it quickly turned into pornography, like just showing up in his feed and people sending him messages. So, like that's a very different algorithm than what we get. In your opinion, like I, I totally love the face approach and giving our kids a little bit at a time. Do you think Instagram is ever safe? No. <laughs> <laughs> Instagram or Snapchat? Snap is definitely a no, yeah. Snap. So Instagram has made massive changes. We've been meeting with them for two years, about every month or two months, and they've made big changes on their platform for more child safety. They've just recently um, changed it so that strangers can't send direct messages to kids, but why did it take us two years to get that? And why are the other platforms not doing it? And I, I'm a little bit complaining and sad. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I, I think it maybe is okay if you're doing it together, right? Like if you're sitting on the couch together and you're like, let's look at this fun stuff together. And then as they get older, 16, 17 is my prior one will do it. And that's, what I, that's what I'm talking more of, like teenagers, like 16 year old. Mm -hmm. you're okay, you're ready for Instagram. Mm -hmm. It depends on how many conversations you have and it depends on your kid and yeah. But you don't, but the, the, our kids want to be there. So do you want them to be there without you? And, and so often they're creating fake accounts. There's, it's like very common in our schools to have like burner phones. Someone is selling burner phones in our school. <laughs> Probably here at American Heritage too. And, and so do you want them to do that behind your back or with you? And so really knowing your kid, it's like you can't, it's hard to just say no across the board. So using it on mom's phone, 
mom or dad's phone. On their phone. Under their mm -hmm. account. Maybe, but still, if they're like surfing on in the living room <laughs> while you're making dinner, yeah. you don't so see everything they see. Theoretically, you'll be able to go back. One thing I've been working with the church on is, is you know, they keep giving me hashtag challenges. Good and bad, good and bad. But the hashtag challenges like strive to be and um, give thanks were like filled with pornography when you check at three in the morning. <laughs> so, you know, if your kids are scrolling on these hashtags that the church is encouraging us to use, um, you gotta be careful. I, I'm not saying don't. I have a little bit of saying don't, I guess. <laughs> And the church has changed their policy. It hasn't come all the way down in the last year, but they're no longer doing these hashtag challenges for youth. I don't know if you've recognized it. It's for adults, but not for youth. Well, it's, people are, can be very insidious, right? Like, yeah. even like when we were talking before with YouTube, um, years ago, I, I was planning something for a class, and there was this like cartoon thing that, was, that I thought was gonna be really good and related to content that I was teaching in, in my class, in my elementary school music class, right? And I always watch everything before I ever display it in my classroom. And so I was watching it and um, and there were, it was like really cutesy and cartoony, but then they slipped in little things that were like Not totally inappropriate. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so yeah, it's, it's hard. I think that's why you know, it comes back to um, little things that we do as parents outside of just the technology, outside of just looking at it together, having regular interviews with our kids, having one-on-one um, -on -one time on a daily basis, even if only for a few minutes, so that we're connecting with them and talking to them. Um, I think then if they do get into trouble, having those frequent conversations right. together, then they're more likely to be like, Mom, I, I gotta tell you about something, you know? And, and then we can be there to help them. Right. I think you're exactly right. That's my experience too. So you can talk about helping us have a healthy relationship with technology or helping our kids. And I know with missionaries, they have like some safeguards or using technology principles. Have in your discussions with the church, are there principles that they would still think the youth understood? Well, I was with them two days ago and I got to see the missionary safeguard program is right now being adapted for youth and primary kids. So it should be out, I don't know when, but it looks close to me. I think it still takes a long time to get through, but it's coming. Cool. <laughs> um, I would just keep thinking about this, and it's not a matter of if they get exposed to pornography, it's kind of a when. So what do you do after? What is the reconciliation like in your conversation with your kid after they're exposed to something? We're crowdsourcing this one too. Okay, your kid is exposed to porn, what do you do? What do you do? What's something? What happened to you? Oh my gosh, you're so bad. Yeah. <sighs> well, I wish I would have had to look differently with my oldest, who's going to be 22 this year, rather than, and we have six kids, and I feel like I've come a long way. But when you said, you know, Satan really wants you to feel shame and or whatever, because and you kind of freak out and you go, oh no, 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 that's totally bad. It's the, it's everything about it is bad. Don't. No, 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 instead of, it's going to happen, you're going to see it, and make it more so that your child knows that you're a safe space to come and land and talk to, instead of, oh, mom's taught me that it's totally bad, so I've seen it, I better not tell her, or I might get in trouble, you know, yeah. that kind of a thing. So, what is something good to do? They come and tell you, what are some things you can say? I would just echo what the uh, sister just said, that when our uh, teenager came to us at the encouragement of our bishop. When our uh, teenager came to us at the encouragement of our bishop uh, to just let us know that uh, he wasn't addicted, but he'd been exposed, and, and it was a concern to him. And um, we did our best, as has been said here, to, to not freak out about it. Uh, obviously, we uh, knew that it would probably cross our path one day. And, uh, and so we just discussed with him what his plan of action could be. And uh, he ended up deciding that uh, whenever he um, you know, felt like he wanted to spend time on the computer and therefore perhaps uh, be vulnerable, he would uh, spend time practicing the piano. And, uh, and this kid, 
has uh, developed a talent that uh, I can't even describe. Uh, he's on a mission now in Jacksonville, Florida, and has had opportunities to, um, with his very first companion, uh, perform duets. He was, uh, the companion was comparably talented on the clarinet. And they put together this uh, beautiful duet uh, and put it out on um, Facebook for to invite people to um, seek that, which was you know beautiful and good report and what have you. It uh, it was exciting to see that situation um, flower into a, an incredible development of talent that uh, he So creating a plan, working with your children to create a plan when and if they see it. And I think particularly something you said is that he helped create, it was his idea to go play the piano. Um, I just wanted to add something. When I was exposed to karate healing, I honestly thought like, oh, if I see a picture or something bad, I'll turn off the screen. And that never crossed my mind. I, I never thought that pornography could come in words. And, uh, and it just, and when my parents found out and freaked out about it, like I had no idea, like nobody had ever told me that. So it's not just like seeing it, it could be reading it mm -hmm. as well. That's a discussion. <laughs> you're right, you're right. The church has a really good video that's kind of what kids and parents can watch together where it goes through like the new like decent pornography. And we revisit that every six to twelve months, like just as the kids are aging up and to remind them. And we've had such open discussion about it and I have a really visually sensitive daughter who's easily triggered and so she'll come to me, Mom, I saw someone immodestly dressed on the computer screen and it's really bothering me. And she uses the words from the video. She's like, tell my brain, I don't want to see that. So we talk a lot about just thoughts in general, not just like pornography, but um, like when they have intrusive thoughts or repetitive thoughts, um, just kind of how to cope with that, how to help your brain change tracks. So we do talk a lot of it. I dated a guy that had seen pornography once. He was in his brother's bedroom for him. And he then like threw it in the trash and replaced it with but then it tortured him for years afterwards. And so I'm really like hyper about it just because I have insight into his heart and to what he struggled with. And so I just, I think like learning how to manage the brain and how to manage that curiosity and say to yourself, it's normal. Like that's where your brain is wired just for it to be normal. We just need to dance around. Dance around. We're all too late. I'm trying. It's not working. us as parents didn't grow up in the world with pornography and our when our parents were raising us it was we talk about it once and then we put it under the couch and we walk away and that was just kind of how it was and so um, consequently those today who are struggling with addictions it's because of how they were how we treated it then mm -hmm. and so I just think it's interesting that in our brains now sometimes even we look at people who have addiction we're like oh wow, pornography addiction, that's so bad. Look how your family's falling apart because of what you did, you know? And it's important that we change that mindset in our life, much like we were talking about in the um, general session about the word of wisdom. And today, like, you hear about someone who's an alcoholic, and you're like, okay, well, go to those steps and figure it out, and, like, you'll be fine, we love you, but... And we just need to change our perspective about pornography so it's not just so, like, taboo and, like, 
oh, like, let's talk about this quietly in this room so nobody else knows that you have a, a problem because it's so prevalent and it's out there. And it's like we said, it's, everyone's going to be exposed to it and we can't keep hiding it like, like we don't want to talk about it. It's like drugs and alcohol, like the D.A.R.E. program. We were all like having this big hoorah in the gym at the D.A.R.E. program. So anyway, that's just kind of been a big thing for my husband and I. Like we can't make it this like hush, hush, don't talk about it. Like it needs to be exposed that Look like how many of you came to this room. When I speak about pornography, the room is packed. Why? Because actually everybody wants to talk about it. Yeah. And so that, that should help give you some courage to find others in your community, in your church, other parents. They want to talk about it. Um, one thing that didn't come up yet is is helping our kids to kind of like media literacy. Helping them understand that what they see in pornography is in real life. That's like not really what intimacy and sex, mm -hmm. sex is. That's not even sex really that they're watching. It's violent. It's extreme in many cases. And that's not even really what bodies look like, like real bodies look like. And so talking through that with them too. I saw pornography for the first time when I was nine years old at my grandfather's home. And it impacted me so much. And like for years I just thought, I don't look like that. You know, I only saw it this like one time. And so really talking about those things too is critical. Oh, right here. So, and that's actually a, a comment I wanted to have was bringing pornography into this is we have a really great curriculum for maturation in kids growing up and um, sexual relations as you're supposed to teach your kids what's going on in their body, what that's all about. And we don't like to have that talk with our kids, but age appropriate, age appropriate, you start at, start at a small age um, of just the basics and answering their questions when they have questions, don't turn them away. But it's an ongoing conversation, it's not a one time talk. And we've brought pornography into that of explaining why pornography is so bad because uh, married relations are so beautiful and so wonderful, and that Satan's way of trying to destroy that. And that helps my kids put into perspective of like, why is that bad? And, curb that curiosity more, I want to see what that's all about, but they hear the healthy side of the good that God put us on earth for, and, and families, and, and all of that. I saw some of that too. Well, I was going to say, like, when, you know, your child comes to you, and I saw something, or I don't understand this, or whatever, I think um, helping them understand that it's still something that we also deal with. show up. It still happens to us and, you know, and say, oh, man, like, thank you so much for telling me. I'm sorry you had to deal with that. I hate it when that happens. And let them know that it's not just a kid thing and someday they'll just grow up and magically the yeah. internet won't be a it's dangerous our place. Too. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot of when that happens, like they stumble upon it. Well, like, if you have any teenage boys, they're not stumbling upon it. They, like, are curious and they are wanting to watch these shows that they hear about from their friends and they're totally inappropriate. I'm like, why, why do you do that? You know, like, okay, Open let's change topics to this one. So <laughs> our children are already using it. Maybe they're using it regularly, but maybe they've used it a few times. Now what's the conversation? Do you have an answer for that one? Yeah, I, um, I was just thinking a lot about like the feelings that some of, you know, if you, if you see pornography or if you're, if you're having questions and you have these feelings that you've never had. And so, so it's easy to, you know, oh, pornography's bad, so these feelings are bad and then they feel shameful. And so I think that, you know, we talked about that before, like the procreation is beautiful and that these feelings are natural and that they have to be expressed in the right way, in this sacred, godly way. And kind of showing that this is Satan's counterfeit for something real, and because the real thing is so wonderful, that's why we have to be so careful to not ruin it and pollute it. And I could just add to, our kids are aroused when they see this. Just like we're aroused if we see something hypersexualized. Like, I know I'm not the only one that has those feelings. You are too. And, and we have to talk about that arousal, that natural physical response, physiological response that they're experiencing. What else can we say and do to help our kids who are already struggling or viewing or watching this? 
Um, I've been reading this book by Dr. Dan Siegel. It's called Brainstorm. It's all about the adolescent brain and how the adolescent brain works. It's fantastic. And he talks in there about how they found that when they appealed to the adolescent brain's desire for uniqueness and rebellion by looking at the cigarette companies and how cigarette companies were trying to exploit youth by getting them addicted young, that by teaching them that, it did more good to stop young addictions than by talking about um, like the, the detriment to their health, the cigarettes. And I totally had that thought this morning when you talked about how companies are absolutely, the porn industry is absolutely spending money to try and get- They're tricking us. Yeah. Feeding us love. To be able to say to your kids, look, they want you hooked, and they want you hooked young because they want to take your money for the rest of your life, and they want to mess you up for the rest of your life so that you're dependent on them. And you don't have to be. So I think that's just one other tool in a whole toolbox that could be used to be able to appeal to that part of the adolescent brain. Um, I'm going to jump on that too and say, right now I feel like our youth are so amazing and they care so much about each other, right? I, they do. They care. They have so, the social justice movement that's sweeping um, our young people. And you got racism. It, it, like Pornography is the last remaining bastion of racism that has completely gone unchecked. But the, there's a study that just came out. The homepage of of Pornhub and X Video, which are the two largest pornography tube sites, 70% um, of the of the images on the homepages were like extremely racist. The content there is so common, or the violence against women, so many things like consent and sexual assault. So also kind of talking about these abuses of the industry sometimes appeals to them. It's again, it's just, a, just another tool to help them to kind of see what's happening. Someone over here. Um, I think one of the best ways is to remember that our children are multifaceted, that they have that some, sometimes I think that when something happens like this in your home, then it's like you do a lot of things out of fear for what's going to happen and you start to be like, this is the only thing about them. And I think when we forget that our kids have more about them than just you're addicted to pornography, then they start to feel like that, you know, either well, if that's all I am, then that's what I'm going to be. Or, and so I think it's just really important to remember that, like, same as we have weaknesses, they do too. And, you know, I just think that's really valuable. That's good. Also, it's, it's not, not always about sex. Like, we don't have to continue hypersexualizing just because suddenly they've seen it now. Our kids, like, we don't need to look at them. I think we do that. Pulling out one thing, there is 
a lot of research about the role of fathers in talking about this stuff and f grandfathers and men. And while we women, we want to talk about it, we will and we should and we need to, when dads talk about it and men in our kids' lives, it's like it just, it's received differently. And so, dads, who are you? <laughs> yeah. Just a response to that. I appreciate that uh, being brought up as a father who has that practice of interviewing kids. I don't do it every week, uh, but I try to do it at least every other month uh, with my kids and uh, talk openly. It's really important uh, that we that we not uh, promote the idea of um, terms either as being shameful. Body terms, body parts, um, you know, Call a penis a penis, and uh, yeah. <laughs> you know I'm sorry to make it everyone uncomfortable. We want to talk about it. Keep saying it. We're not uncomfortable. But uh, make uh, make it comfortable for our kids to discuss it and talk about it, so that they don't feel ashamed just to have a discussion. <coughs> I just wanted to refer to the person that said, you know, when somebody has uh, an addiction, we tend to judge them and look down on them. We need to remember that most likely that addiction started with them being a victim. Yeah, I, I think those who are struggling with pornography are victims too, and a lot of a lot of things have been taken from them. And if we can have more empathy and understanding for that as well, um, I have I think I have to be a good hostess. But you guys, look, you have each other. Many of you live here, and you all care about this, and you came to talk about it. I did a fraction of the talking compared to all of you. So you have incredible resources here, and many of you know. If you crowdsource, you have the answers. So um, I'm going to just rattle off a few of my favorite resources for you. So Protect Young Eyes is the one I already announced. It's really my most favorite. They have a new app. Um, I'm forgetting what it's called now, but if you go to their website, you can see the app. Is it a dot org? Dot, I think, like, does it have a dot anything behind it or no? One of them. Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay that's all good. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's dot com. Okay. Okay. It's dot com. Okay. It's dot com. Yeah, protect you. This is why I was like, which one? There's two. And Protect Young Minds changed their name to Defend Young Minds now. This is the old Hannah. So Defend Young Minds wrote the book, Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, if you all are familiar with it. It's a great just conversation starter. And they have a junior version for even like your three year olds. And, um, and Defend Young Minds also has a new tool out. It's so good. It's called the Brain Defense Program. And it's just like, they have a brain gang and these videos you watch with your kids. It's ideal for like age 7 to 12. If you're a girl, maybe it seems, girls are more mature earlier, so maybe they don't like it after 11. But <laughs> It's called Defend Young Minds, and they have two great tools, some books and uh, like a, a quick curriculum that talks about how to like, control your thoughts, a lot of things we talked about. My most favorite kind of filter, it's a filter, but it's so much more, it's called Bark. I really hope you guys get it. I'm like, just want to shake it and everyone get it if you have kids online. It's, they have two systems. So they have a, um, a router filter, $79 on Amazon. That's $79 you can spend. And you can set different settings for different devices. So like for me, I set mine so the internet goes off on my phone at 11, because I mean at 10, because otherwise I'll just keep like scrolling, right? How many of you do that? So a little self-control. <laughs> but then I can have different filters for my kids, and each kid, depending on. So that's the Bark router filter. And then there's the Bark app, which, you guys, this is so good. Our kids are struggling with way more than the explicit material. They're struggling with self-body image issues, with bullying, with uh, hate speech, and 
Bark tracks like 31 kind of problematic these, like, issues that our kids are struggling with. And you get an alert if there's anything like that. And, it, and when you get the alert, you even get some talking points and conversation starters. So it's so good. So Bark. So those are my favorite. And I can't end without saying our organization, we are activists. And I didn't talk a lot about that here, but we're going after companies that are partnering with pornography or are enabling sex trafficking. And we call them out on it and we ask them to stop. And I would love it if you joined us and helped us ask them to stop because it really works. Last year, Google, after five years of advocacy and you, people like you signing petitions and sending us stories, Google finally changed their policy to turn on all filters, the built-in controls, on all of the K-12 products. So the American Heritage School, if you're using YouTube here, YouTube for School, now finally the built-in filters are turned on. And, it's, and so in a lot of like lower income schools, that's too much of a burden for school administrators to figure out how to turn all that on. So that happens September 1st. I homeschool, it even works for homeschool Chromebooks. So, um, I just invite you to join with us in taking action, and our website is insexualexploitation.org. I don't know, how, I'm drinking like so much in Utah, it's like the <laughs> elevation or what? Yeah, the air just senses yeah. the water in you and... <laughs> end? End! We're ending it! End the sexualexploitation.org. And thank you all for helping each other today, and. If I can be further resource, I would be glad to. My colleague Catherine lives here and can come back when I can. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I had to know it was on. Like, thank you. <laughs> So just kind of, well, one, one thing I just wanted to kind of acknowledge in this room, there are so many of us that care deeply about this type of ad advocacy, and we are so grateful to you, Don, for all of the work and the teaching um, and the strength you bring to that. So let's give her one more round of applause, please. <laughs> We have time for maybe a short little break. This isn't our snack break, but if you're staying in here, we have Shannon Foster coming, the redheaded hostess. Um, or in our other track, in our homeschool track, we're doing um, kind of the, the AHS Worldwide teams are going to sound a lot on the video, video you saw at lunch. Great, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so that should transmit to this. Sure. So we should make sure.
Okay, you're good. I recognize you. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> how are you? Good, how are you? Very you did. Too. It doesn't feel like yeah, it's just like normal, right? Well, kind of. I mean, it's a little weird. <laughs> no. you know, like, <laughs> did not be on a phone. Oh no, that's true. Yeah, but we're like all here oh, for you. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's weird, guys. That's weird. <laughs> Thank you for teaching us. Oh, I just help myself and I share it. Oh, this is incredible. You're incredible. Thank you. I want to hug you so much, Oh, my gosh. I just really am so grateful for you. I seriously have, like, changed my life. I just tell myself, like, what would I want to teach my kids? And then I just share it. So that's Well, I'm that's really my glad, trick. You, I'm glad you're not hurting. And yeah. your study guides for me is so good, too. Oh. Like, I'm learning something new. Oh, that's good. So You can go home this evening, tomorrow, on our Sabbath day, incorporate um, these tools and information and truth. All right, Shannon Foster. Thanks. Okay. That was a moment. Okay. Uh, I hate introductions. Just move that out of the way. <laughs> Thank you, but not from Kristen. I love that from Kristen. Um, is there a clock in here? Okay, so we have till 310 unless we go longer. <laughs> okay, so you still, that's where we're at. Um, so, okay, quick background. So I taught seminary for 13 years. I taught in full-time in Salt Lake area. 
I taught at Copper Hills and West High and East High. And I retired at seven months pregnant. And my students threw me a baby shower, a surprise baby shower. <laughs> I had no idea. I walked into my classroom, it was decorated, and it was so sweet because at East High, you have all kinds of students. And there was one that I'll never forget had gone to the DI to get baby gifts. And had just, that was hard earned money for her. And it was just like, but it was such a pleasure to retire mid-year because they saw me going to be a mother. And that was a big lesson. And it was big for, it was like they got to experience, because I'd been married for three years, we'd struggled to get pregnant and um, they were kind of on this journey with me of like, oh, I got to announce it at the beginning of the year and then they, it was exciting. So um, when I retired, I had started this little blog and I have to tell you, like, I am very a private person. I don't like people to know what I'm doing. I, I'm like back row, that's just my natural personality unless I have a, a calling and then I'll do all the dancing and the singing. But I'm generally like back row at church, that's just like my natural personality. And um, so I felt just this inclination to start this blog and I didn't know what to call it and my friends called me the redheaded hostess because I love to have people over and just treat people and um, so I named it that and I didn't know what it was gonna turn into. I had no clue but my husband kept saying, because I, I taught for so long and I was able to train seminary teachers and I was able to like sit in a classroom and get the information coming from the church office building and this is what they want us to do and try to deliver that to the teachers in seminary and institutes. And I was, came to this understanding by the time I was retiring that in the ideal world it was parents that got this information. That it was them that had these tools and that seminary only became an accessory to what the students were already getting. And I was like, but how? And, and this was kind of at the beginning of the internet world and just this explosion of technology that's now putting tools in your hands like never before. I really do believe this is the generation that can bring the scriptures alive in homes like never before because of tools. I don't know how my mother would have un ever understood Isaiah when she was raising us, but we can understand Isaiah. So this is just a timing thing. It's a last days thing. It's perfect timing thing. So then I just started this little blog and it's grown and now we have probably about 20 people on my team and amazing, amazing people that I work with. And our number one thing we always say is, what can we do to make the parents the hero? So that you can do what you really wanna do in your home, which is to strengthen your children. And so we're always like trying to take ourselves out of it. Like what is it that parents need? What information do they need? What tools do they need? And about um, a year ago, we brought on this new hire, and it was a big it was a big deal to bring her on to our staff. And I said, I want you to take things off my shoulders so I have time to really discover what good teaching is in the home. I need time to think about that because. <laughs> I just operate on deadlines all the time <laughs> and I needed people to help me so I could just take a step back and say okay if I've got 20 minutes with my child what can we do in that 20 minutes that will make a difference and so I'm not just checking a box that hey I taught something that they leave ready to do something about what we learned and so I was like I just really need time to research and I just started this process and my team supported this process and over the next like nine months, it was like we just totally took this shift. And I wanna just teach you some of the things I've learned so you can implement things in your home. And I always say if you can get one good idea, it's like worth it all the time it took to get that one idea. So I'm gonna share with you some ideas. So, oh, I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Um, I've talked about, like if you've heard my podcast, I've talked about the story, so I'm going to be repeating myself if you've heard it, but um, I want to tell you a story that changed me as a young seminary teacher. 
So I was teaching at Copper Hills High School, which is in South Jordan, and I had this darling student. She was like the perfect student. And at the beginning of the year, I'd always give this kind of an assessment so I could kind of see, all right, this is what, where the students are. They know how to use the scriptures. They don't know how to use the scriptures. This is what they know about the plan of salvation. It was like two pages. And one of them was to draw out the plan of salvation and to label it. And I had some questions about the plan of salvation. And then at parent-teacher conference, I would hand the test to the parents so they could see. And wouldn't you love to see what your children answered on these? Like, you're, no one's there telling them the answers. <laughs> and so um, I had this test, and she did not do well, like, at all. She was probably one of the worst scores in my 120 students. And it surprised me because she just seemed like she would know all the answers, but she didn't. She didn't know hardly anything about the plan of salvation. And both of her parents came in to parent-teacher conference, and they were sitting there, and I gave them the test. And I just will never forget that they could not even talk. They were so surprised. And the father and the mother just, like, they, they didn't want to talk about parent-teacher conference because they were so surprised by their answers. And the mom is like a scriptorian. And they were just talking to each other. And, the dad said, I know what happened. He said, and he looked at me and he says, we have scripture study every day, but she is the youngest and we've never taught her on her level. And it was like this <laughs> moment for me to go, how we teach matters. And you, I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> You're like, yes, <laughs> we already know. But it totally shifted. And because even in a classroom, like, even I might have a, a student body of similar ages, they're all over the board in what they're ready for. And so that is why the home is the best place to learn. Because even if I was trying to be a really good seminary teacher, I only had them for a certain amount of time. Um, there's so many factors. There's factors like if they just saw the boy they liked in the hall at school, <laughs> they are not thinking about <laughs> what you're talking about. And so there's just, if there's an assembly or if it's a nice day outside or if the boy next to them is disruptive or there's so many factors in a classroom that you, you have in the home but they're different. And so, and plus they don't open up. They don't open up in front of their peers as much. And so it's hard for me to really assess how they're doing. And the parents are just for that alone. They're the ideal. The home is the ideal learning environment. And so that changed my teaching and put me on this kind of path of, okay, how do we actually get on their level so they can absorb what we're learning? So I'm going to share 10 ideas um, that worked for me. These are things that I've been discovering and are working for me. And then you can, they're like tools in a toolbox. You don't, you don't necessarily use all of them all the time, but this is the first one that I think is the most important. And um, when I would teach seminary, I would, at the end of the school year, I would set out candy bars like this. And I'd say, okay, best impersonations of me, get a candy bar. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't know what you do, like little things that, <laughs> like this, I don't know. And so, the kids would like be very bashful at first and then pretty soon all the candy bars are gone and they're having a heyday like copying you and they'd always come up and be like Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> like draw all over the board so, which is what I'm about to do so okay okay so this is probably one of the most important things and I think about this with my four-year-old I think about this this is my 10-year-old and then I, if you teach teens this is especially important for teens so okay This is really a loud board, okay. So this is, okay, our job is to teach in a way that they can learn. We want them then to act upon what they're learning. So if we teach in a way that they can't absorb what we're learning, they can't act upon it. So like my student who was being taught on a higher level, it's gonna be harder for her to act upon something that's over her head. So we want to, this is what we want to get really good at, 
so they can actually learn. And then when they choose to act, and we can invite them to act, but they have to choose this, then they will receive evidences in their life. And this is where growth happens. And I was at a, an event with Elder Bednar, and he, he's since, he's given talks about this, and he's written books about this, about not being objects that are acted upon, but to act. But at this event, with, he was teaching um, Seminary Institute employees, he drew this upside down helix like this, or he had a board. It's like an upside down, or like a tornado. And up it went, um, it was different words, but it, it was the same words, but different. But learning, acting, and then you receive evidence. And so you start small, but then, then you repeat it. So you would then learn, act, evidence. Learn, act, evidence. Learn, act, evidence. But it's not, it's, this isn't a correct diagram. This is a correct diagram of learn, act, evidence, learn, act, evidence. And where do we want our children on this? Like way up here, right? So if they're on Instagram and a very cleverly worded post comes that is going to shake their faith, it doesn't even, it's like shield of faith, boop. Like that dart just goes off. That's what we want. But our children are gonna start down here and they're gonna need to choose to go up this and down here is where we're going to be nurturing more. This is where they're going to be in our home, and this is where we're going to just be constantly inviting and teaching and giving them the skills. And then when they get up here, they're probably going to be more self-governing in their learning and their acting. <coughs> and then we just get to enjoy the view. <laughs> and so at some point, they need to do it on their own, but we are going to be more involved down here. And then the earlier they can grow, the safer they can be spiritually. So this is, I really want to talk about these two things, because we can't give them evidence, right? Like this is going to be the Holy Ghost, and it's going to be the Lord blessing them in many, many different ways. But this is what we can constantly be doing. So we can talk about this. So this, I keep in mind. I keep this in mind with my four-year-old even. Like, how can I set the stage so that this growth can happen and we can climb this faster? And every one of us in this room are going to be on different places. And this is not, it's never going to be, not one of us is going to be this. We're going to be like this. <laughs> right. Do you see why my students said that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So if we can continue this. And I want to, um, have any of you heard the Elder Bednar podcast he did about a month ago? It's on All In. Yes, it's amazing. Everyone write this down. It's so the All In Podcast, Elder Bednar. I wrote down Living in Revelation. Listen to it like 10 times. Living in Revelation. It's so good. And I want to tell you something he said on there. So the host asked him, how do we help, I don't know who she was talking about, how do we help others feel empowered? And he basically was like, that's the wrong question. He said, you don't help them feel empowered. You invite them to act. For example, in the church you say, well, we're going to help strengthen their faith. He said, he's, and he said, he's like, no, we're not. <laughs> he said it like that. No, we're not. <laughs> An individual has to strengthen their own faith. And so our, our responsibility is to invite, to entice, to encourage then to act, them to act. I think sometimes we talk way too much and we invite way too little. We think, well, if there's a problem in the ward, let's have someone give a talk about it. But to me, the greater question, <laughs> you guys aren't laughing because it's true. Okay? But to me, the greater question is, what would we need to do in order to learn the lesson that we hope is learned? The focus is not on what should I say. The question is what invitation will help the people learn what they need to learn so they get that evidence. So uh, an example of this is, because uh, my personal experience has been, the scriptures are the best invitation to act. So in a few weeks, you're gonna be studying Gideon, and hopefully I can like, get you excited for this, because Gideon's like smack in the middle of the scripture, so like, we don't learn a lot about that story sometimes, like once we get past Genesis, right, or First Nephi. But Gideon was a judge, and he was just a normal person. 
and he lived during a time when the Israelites were wicked, and, but there were some righteous among them, and he was one of them. And it, it just paints the story. We don't know who wrote the book of Judges, but I want to meet them one day. They were a good writer. And he painted the story that the Midianites had combined with other nations, and they'd come like grasshoppers upon the land. And they were destroying the, their crops and their beasts, and the people were running and hiding in the caves. And these are the Israelites. These are the people of God, and they're hiding in caves. And it introduces Gideon by saying that he was threshing wheat near a wine press. <coughs> and that can be lost to us, except for, like, the ancient reader would be like, oh, really? <laughs> We're like, okay. <laughs> he should have been threshing on a threshing floor, but that would have been out in the open for the Midianites to see. And so he was hiding. He was threshing wheat, mm -hmm. hiding. And so the ancient reader would be like, oh, that's not a good place to thresh wheat. And so it's kind of introduced as somebody who's hiding in the background, who's afraid of being seen. And he goes and he's threshing wheat and the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, you're going to deliver Israel from the Midianites. And his answer was like, uh, and just like Moses and just like Enoch and all, um, I'm the youngest in my house, <laughs> like has all these reasons and we would have all these reasons and your children will have all these reasons when they're called to something big. And the Lord said, mighty man of valor, that's what he called him. And he said, I'll be with you. And then the story goes to Gideon where he does, he just, he starts gathering an army and it, it skips that part. He suddenly got 32,000 people. It skips how he got that. I want that chapter in there. And because how did he go from threshing wheat in the wine press to gathering 32,000 going against the Midianites? And they were scared. And then the story, if you know the story, the Lord's like, the army's too big. And so he says, tell the people who are scared that they can go home. And 22,000 leave, which tells you how scared they were. And 10,000 are left, and then they go down to the river and take a drink, and the ones that brought their hands up to the mouth. So there's 300 left, and so the, we won't go through the whole story. But this story, if you open up a story like this, uh, if you lay open Gideon to your children, they can connect to it more than you could say, you need to be strong. You could say those words, but Gideon will show them how to be strong and how you can be afraid, and then suddenly, they overcame this enormous army with 300 soldiers. And they can get to know that story and put it in their heart. And that might make a difference when they're walking through the halls at school or when they're at camp and somebody says something inappropriate or when they're on Instagram scrolling and something, someone attacks them or fill in all the links. Gideon can be a hero and that makes them act and they'll receive evidence. And so the scriptures, and we could go through, we could do it with Aunt Ruth. We could talk about Ruth. And your children are suddenly like, they want to serve people differently because of Ruth. All of these people in the scriptures are the best ways to learn. And so, and plus, um, if you've had this experience yet in the Old Testament, the Old Testament connects us, it turns our hearts to the fathers, and we want to gather Israel. When we get into this part where they're scattered, it's going to break your heart. And you're going to be like, we need to gather them back together. And then you'll understand why President Nelson keeps talking about it's the most important thing you can do. The Old Testament can turn your hearts, and it's real, true learning. But we can say this about any book of scripture, by the way. <laughs> but I always say, if you want to open up the majesty of the scriptures, you can't even just give a lesson on it. You just have to talk about the stories and show that they will change you, and they'll change your children, and they'll strengthen them. There's a reason why we have them, and we were given more as the last days opened. Just as Joseph Smith came to earth, he got the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine of Covenants. We were given more scripture to get to these last days. What a gift. It is our manna from heaven. So anything we can do to help our kids do this, they will automatically start doing this. Because Gideon's story is an invitation to act. OK, so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about, is keeping that in our mind all the time, is what invitations can you give? Our, 
like how can they really learn, and we'll talk more about that, and then invite them to act upon what they're learning, then they'll receive the evidences, and that's where conversion comes, and that's our goal. Okay, um, second is this word. So I've talked to many mothers about teaching their children in the home, and they're very scared of the word teaching. And they'll say, I'm not a teacher. Well, you don't have to be a teacher. You, you want to be a nurturer. So what are some words besides this that explain nurturing? So let's just put other words on the board besides nurture, so you can just call them out. Loving, oh, okay, good. Oh, these are good already, okay. Loving, wait, say it louder. Okay. This is such a lot board. <laughs> Guiding. Guiding, good. Inspired, good. I like that one. What? Protect, Protect good. Guide. I want to add nourish, nourish, careful. I want to add notice. Okay, we could keep going for a lot longer. Um, so, when you think about nurturing a plant, it's it's very individualized. <coughs> what nutrients does that plant need? how much water, how much sunlight. If you've ever raised a plant from a seed, you know that there's steps, right? And our children each need their own steps. And you don't need to be a teacher, like a certified teacher, like here's your certification. You need to be these words. And that is the best teacher. And sometimes I think we feminize the word nurture, but our husbands can be these words and their strengths. So this is what we need to be. We need to, and I put notice because um, Elder Bednar gave a general conference talk and I can't quote it, but he talked about, t he was specifically talking about teaching the Book of Mormon in our home and that as you do, you'll notice your children's questions, like you'll notice their faith by the questions they ask. And this, this is why the home is so much better than the classroom because your kids probably won't, like we always had like our magic four students that talked a lot and then everyone else was quiet. So you can't notice. You can just read body language. But in the home, they're more likely to ask a question that maybe sounds doubting that they would never ask in a classroom. So these are words that we need to be. And um, so we want to be a nurturer. We don't want to be like a teacher and that changes. Sometimes we think we've taught a lesson, but we haven't nurtured. And this is like what's getting to their hearts. It's the learn. That's how they learn is by us nurturing. Okay, so seek to be those words. Um, okay, the third idea. I had, I had two titles, and you can just choose one you want. It's one is make it taste good, and the other was is individual teaching. Make it taste good sounds so much better. But um, I had a friend that said that, like sh that her mom would always say, make it taste good to whatever age they're at. And th it takes wisdom to know what that means because um, they, they'll probably tell you that tasting good means fun and exciting. And if you've ever worked with young women and they're like, okay, have them go plan lessons, and that everything needs to be like fireworks and fun and like. But they, that's not necessarily what they want, but they think that's what they want. What they want is growth. What they want is to become who they're meant to become. And if you can help them along that path and have activities shaped that way, then they come because they don't want to miss out on what they could possibly gain. But they might think, 
but we just want to go bowling, and, and those things are important, but it's the EFY model of the perfect blend of things. And so making it taste good, like for my four-year-old son, who is just your typical boy, and this lately family prayer it means like the button is pushed, that back flips need to be happening. <laughs> like that's just like the past three weeks. <laughs> it's been awesome. But so I've been like, okay, so what does he need? And um, we got these, we have a folder that we keep all of our scripture study stuff in at night. And so he's fine during scripture study. And then as soon as they say family prayer, it's like, huh. <laughs> and so I just got these stickers. And every time he's reverent during a prayer, he gets to put a sticker on and boom, it's worked. Mm -hmm. That's what he needed for now. And I don't know if it will always work. But it's just that individualized. I, I don't want him to get in trouble because that will do the opposite of he, he will now hate family prayer. So, did you guess? One thing that we've done, we have one of those back flips. <laughs> anyway, um, but different learning techniques, one visual, one's auditory, yeah. one's the back flipper. <laughs> you know, so I live with my daughter, and what's happened, what we've decided, she takes the oldest one, because she can talk on a more, an older level, and read scriptures with her in the evening. I read with the middle one every night. And now dad is reading with the back flipper. So, <laughs> individual, one on one. Yes. And it's getting through with it. Yes. You know, so. I think there's perfect, great times for family learning. Um, individual learning is super important, too. So, to, I know that the worst way for me to learn is in a Sunday school class, if we go up and down the row and I'll read a scripture. It never gets through to me. And I love the scriptures, and my mind wanders. And so that's not typically we, something we do in our home because I think with my children, all I'm telling them is that the scriptures are important, but they're not actually going to be learning and being able to act on what they're learning. There's going to be no evidences other than the spirits in our home when we're, <laughs> we're studying the scriptures because I want them to actually learn about Gideon and be able to act. And so, and but that's probably because I'm, I think I have a little ADD. So <laughs> I like put that into my home because I'm like, everyone must have it if I have it, right? <laughs> yes. So if you don't take turns reading, what does scripture study look like in your home? Okay, so, okay, it changes. Um, right now, I'll tell you what it looks like right now. Um, on Sundays after church, we come home, and I, I usually try to find a video. Um, if you've ever heard of Superbook, it's a Bible animation. It's like an app, or you can get some on YouTube. They've done a really good job on most of the Bible stories. I do not like how they depicted Jacob, but we'll do that. We'll talk about that another time. <laughs> so, and I, so it's an introduction to my children visually. My four-year-old really responds to it. Um, my 10-year-old loves them, huh? She loves them. Super book. And I think they've done a really good job. It's a Christian. They've done mostly, now there's going to be some times when you can pause it and say, okay, doctrinally, how would you have done that differently? And, but I used to do that in seminary because seminary didn't have it. When I first started, they didn't have a huge video series. And we showed a lot of the Lamb of God. And I think that's what it was. But they were like, Lazarus, come forth from the tomb. <laughs> it was almost like scary. <laughs> and I would pause it and I'd say, okay, I want you to read this and how would you have, if you were the director. So I'm actually okay when it's not exactly how I like it. It can create a good conversation. And so I will show that and get them to wind down. I give them lunch after church and they can watch a video. And then um, I give them their scripture journals and we do scripture journaling about that story. So my 10 year old is then in her scriptures. And I do it that way because she's learning to read the scriptures and it is a skill to learn scripture language, but it's a lot easier if she already knows something about what's happening. So I, that's why I do it in that order. And then, um, so we spend, after church, we, that's our biggest chunk of time, and then the rest of the week at night, we talk about something from that story. So some kind of application, maybe we watch a little video, maybe we memorize a scripture, maybe so, and that's working at their ages, um, and then we'll, 
you know, shift. And at some point, you know, as they get older, then I'll try to nurture a different kind of learning for them. And we'll talk about that in a second. But that's, that's what we do. Um, but it will change because it needs to change, depending on what they need. And so, I don't know, does anyone have any tips on like, oh, this is what we do and it works really good? And if you're a homeschooler, you kind of have built-in time often, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I know Cassie does. She's <laughs> like built-in amazingness. Like, I should just like turn all of my Instagram over to her. Have you seen the Light Up Online videos? Um, they're all I've all heard of it, but I haven't. Are they good? Okay, yeah, good. LDS, so, LDS yes. Okay, put that in your toolbox. Okay, excellent. <laughs> and then the church has their videos, but they're short, like three minutes. And so that's more like something we'll do on a Wednesday night, not like right after church when they need to wind down for a minute. So I love all these things. Um, I love media in its proper place. But my kids, I want them in the scriptures. And even my four-year-old, to the degree of like, I'll say, circle Joseph's name because I want him to know this is a Bible story and it's different from Paw Patrol. <laughs> right? So it's just the, the little tricks. Yeah. So what's your opinion about using scriptures that are actually physical scriptures versus scriptures on their phone? I think it's a preference. I think teens like um, phones. I have my kids in a physical set of scriptures and I, they have their own scripture boxes with like my son has car pens and a dinosaur pen, and I has, she has gel pens and washi tape, and I want them in the scriptures, marking, coloring, gluing in pictures. Um, I just want them familiar with the actual Bible, like finding something in the scriptures, because finding something on your phone is very different than finding something in a book. So I like physical scriptures. Um, that's what I prefer, but as people age and I've talked to so many teachers of what are you using and a lot of them are you did we do EFY oh Chris together <laughs> I just like, I know you sunflower <laughs> you were the AD and then I was the next year <laughs> we'll talk after <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Okay, but I, I just talked to, um, there's a seminary teacher on my staff and he prefers, um, and, and the kids in his classroom prefer their phones mm -hmm. for the most part. So you almost have to like, just go with what they'll do. But my young kids, I want them in there. I want them learning how to use the Bible. Yeah, Kristen. Oh, five minutes, oh, oh no. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> right. okay, I <laughs> okay, I think this is probably one of the, two of the most important, three, uh, okay. Um, one thing that's really come to me as uh, over the years, and I've talked a lot about this, is the importance of at your own pace learning. And I think most children have the pace determined for them depending on who's teaching them, whether it's, it's a family paced, a classroom paced, or a seminary paced. Like it's the teacher telling them and then they're learning and then it's over and they're moving on. But if I think about the times I have learned the most from the scriptures, it's been when it's been me and the scriptures and the spirit and you know tools I'm using. But there's nobody talking. Not that that can't be a powerful learning experience, but when you can slow down, and especially when you can write down what you're learning, that is when real learning happens. And the Spirit can teach you, and you might stay in one verse, or your child might stay in one verse, and dig deep into that verse. And so the sooner we can get them into this, um, whether they're journaling, or at the younger and younger age, because at some point, if you want them to really fall in love with the scriptures, they need to be in the scriptures at their own pace. And so the younger they can get there, the faster they'll go up this. But you have to do it in a way that they can digest it. I, my four-year-old can't do it. I do it a little bit with my 10-year-old, but it's very careful so that she's not overwhelmed with the task. So 
this is just something you might want to pay attention to so that they're not always just getting the gospel given to them and that, that they learn that it takes work to get an answer. There are answers in the scriptures. There is no answer that you can't get like real solid information for that will give you peace. There's, um, when I was, um, when we were about to do Doctrine and Covenants, I got all of these, not all, but a lot of messages on Instagram of people afraid to study the Doctrine and Covenants because they were afraid to study the life of Joseph Smith because they thought it would shake their faith. And I was like, it is the exact opposite is true. <laughs> the exact opposite is true. There is no question he cannot stand up to. But you have to do the work, and you will wonder why you ever had that question. But you have to do the work. And so we have to teach our children that if they hear something that goes, hmm, do the work. The answer is there, and the faith that they will have that I can give the answer if I can do the work. But the quicker you can teach them how to do the work, and you can be the best example of that. And this is, I'll close with this. <laughs> this is a good close. If you ever feel like I'm not a scriptorian, neither was I. I grew up in a home that didn't, my dad was anti-Mormon. We didn't talk about the scriptures. Um, it doesn't matter. When I was hired to teach seminary, they were just, they just wanted to know if I could control a classroom full of teenagers. They, they wanted to know I had a testimony and I was required to take certain classes, but they never gave me a test because they knew I had the capacity, because we all do, to learn the gospel. That being a scriptorian isn't for a small group. It is for anybody who wants it. And so they knew that that would happen naturally. So if there's any concerns that you have, your children are likely to have those same concerns when they're parents. So you model for them how to overcome those obstacles. You model for them what you hope they do when they're teaching their children. Because they'll also have soccer practice and piano practice and all the things and this calling and work and all these things. And so you model for them that the, we don't put the most important things off because they will also have those obstacles. And I just try to picture myself like, okay, like I'm a fountain and if I have water to give, it will naturally go to my children. And so if I study the stories first, like Gideon, for example, there is no way I'm not teaching that story to my kids because I want them to know Gideon. But how easy would it be for judges to come and go, that book of judges, and we miss Gideon? But if you're in it first, even if you just sit down with them, no pictures, no anything, and you're like, I have to tell you about Gideon, that can just be like the exact thing they needed. So out of all the things we talked about, you filling your well will make the biggest difference than anything else in getting them to learn, and then you'll know what invitations to give, to act upon. So I want to testify. I think every year I could just be like, oh, I have the Old Testament. Oh, the, the New Testament? I'm writing the New Testament books right now, and I'm like, oh, the New Testament. <laughs> I, the scriptures have changed me. I am a better mother, wife, friend, neighbor, I don't even, I wonder what weakness is, and I don't have to wonder that hard. <coughs> I would still have, or have a lot louder, if the scriptures, meaning the gospel, taking root in me, and the atonement being able to work in me. Because of the scriptures, when you read these stories, you're seeing what happens. You see the long game in somebody's life. You see like Ruth, boom, like you see like what happened when she put Christ first. And then she became an ancestor to the Messiah. She wouldn't have not, she would never would have known that when she was first making her decisions. But the scriptures have the exact stories that we need to fortify us and our children. And the more my children know, the stronger they can be. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jan. I think I could sit here and learn from you all day long. Oh, just one more. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah. We love you. 
Okay, we are going to um, make our way back that direction um, to the auto demand. Feel free to get some water and a snack on your way down there. Um, and then we'll end up coming back for dinner. Oh, so we've got some, um, I know. I mean, I I kind of one thing I just wanted to know, if you haven't been, you, you came in these doors <laughs> over here oh. and checked in, you might have noticed oh, this little stand there. And what that is, it's a phone stand. And, and we put that there that you can just put up your phone and take some pictures. And so we'll have some more time just for socialization and a little bit less structured um, after this closing part. So feel free to um, spend some more time around here. Um, if you can stay for dinner, we'd love to have you. Really? Oh, oh, there is like a bond between redheads, right? Like, you're like, yeah. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're, thank you. Everything you do is wonderful. Oh, you're so nice. Thank you. Oh. Oh, that's I just started using your materials since January. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, any suggestions? Oh, no. I will. I'll Oh, I mean, I've, I've done podcasts on most of them, so that could help, but I don't know. I, oh, I should have talked about that one. Are they titled? Like, do you have a um, like, like, How do I know which ones to look for? There's only 11 podcasts, so... Uh, yeah, yeah. Most of them, yes. Oh. Not that one, but well, I'll do one on that one. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're all like, we want to. Thank you. Oh, like, I just feel the spirit 